I'm still acting as organizer, but has uh, COVID, fortunately, hopefully nobody else uh, gets COVID. So Silke is back next week, so I think we're going to take over. And uh, then you have Robin Salinger, who's going to tell us more stories. Thank you. Actually, I have two stories to tell you, so I'm going to try to make them both as succinct as possible. So the first story I'm going to tell you about is modeling shape transformations in liquid-crystal elastomers. Those are not living objects, although they sort of mimic living objects, but the main point of this for the, for the people modeling living tissues is actually the algorithm that we use, which is a homemade finite element code, which is really useful for modeling living objects. That's not what we've done with it here. So I wanna to dedicate uh, today's uh, discussion to the memory of Professor Mark Warner of right here in Cambridge, who was uh, such an important person in the liquid crystal elastomer community, and whose loss we are still reeling from. Um, okay, so liquid crystal elastomers. I don't know if you guys have read about these before. Liquid crystal elastomers are polymers that are responsive by changing their shape in response to a stimulus. And the stimulus could be as simple as a change of temperature. Um, it could be an electric or magnetic field. Um, some materials are doped with a, a light sensitive dye so they can respond to illumination. So you shine light on them and they move. Um, and they can also respond to their chemical environment uh, by changing shape. They are smart and programmable materials. So it's a, it's a liquid crystal. I assume everyone here knows something about liquid crystals. We heard a great talk by Paula the other day about them. So liquid crystals are characterized by a vector field that describes the local orientation of the pneumatic director, the uh, orientation of an elongated molecule. That is a paper binder. So this movie was made right here in Cambridge by Eugene Terentiev. I haven't seen him since I got here. I don't know if he's on vacation or if he's around, but this is a video that he made. It is not real time. He sped this up, right? But that's, a, so the elastomer is the, the, the vertical uh, piece of tape there is what it looks like. And as he's heating and cooling it, it's stretching and shrinking. So as you can see, the strains are enormous. This is not a few percentage change in shape. It's, it's a huge change in shape. Um, in this particular material, the pneumatic director is, is pointing up. And the material is shrinking and growing along the direction of the, of the pneumatic orientation. But if you program it by making the pneumatic director not uniform in the sample, instead of just stretching and shrinking like an artificial muscle, you can make the material bend, twist, fold, do all kinds of things. You can do auto origami, a material that folds itself. And you can also have spontaneous oscillation, typically through a mechanism involving self-shadowing. So, and I will show you one of those. Okay, so what is this stuff at the micro scale? Well, at the, at the, the molecular scale, um, there's different types of liquid crystal elastomers. I'm not a chemist, please don't ask me the, the complete details. So I'll give you the physicist cartoon version. Um, you can essentially have mesogens, which are represented here just by ellipsoids, and they can be bonded together in different ways. They can just be built into the main chain of the polymer and kind of look like, you know, in the cartoons, I always used to see sausages that came in, in long strings. Are they sold here that way in the UK? You never find those in the US. They always sell separate sausages. But anyway, if you string them all together, that's a main chain. They can be dangling off the main chain and attached on the side, or they can be dangling off the main chain and attached at the end. Okay, and the key issue here is that you tend to, to get the materials, uh, to fabricate them and get the, the pattern in there. You essentially uh, cross-link cross -link them partially is one way to do it, and then stretch them a little bit to align them, uh, and then cross-link further. And then when you heat them, they shrink along the pneumatic director. There's actually a lot of different ways to pattern them. If you really want to know all of that, Chrissy Akaki wrote a fantastic review in 2018. There's also a wonderful textbook about these materials by Warner and Trentiev. Um, so uh, what kind of patterning can we do? The simplest thing to do is to put a twist in the director and all your liquid crystal devices, the, the original liquid crystal display, which by the way, the inventor was at Kent State, um, uses a twisted uh, geometry for the director. So uh, in that case, what we do is you can actually rub two pieces of glass, one east-west, one north-south, put a pneumatic liquid crystal in between, in this case also with monomers cross-linking agents, um, and then a little chiral dopant to make sure, because when you have a 90 degree twist, you can twist clockwise or counterclockwise. So a chiral dopant is a, a chiral additive that uh, encourages the system to twist in a particular direction so you don't get any defects. 
And then you can shine UV light through the one of the pieces of glass or both sides, if you prefer, and cross-link that twist in there. What happens when you take this thing, so you, you form the material between two pieces of glass, you remove, now you have a, a little thin film polymer with this twist across it. Uh, when you remove the two pieces of glass, and then, so the material, if it's still at the same temperature where it was cross-linked, it'll be just flat. From that, we typically cut uh, strips, and the strips can be cut east-west, north-south, or at any angle, and depending on what angle we cut, and so on, you can get all kinds of different shapes. So you can get a ho something hollow that looks like the tube that you your paper towels come on if you opened it up, or it can actually twist like a piece of rotini. Um, and then we can actually inscribe topological defects into the, these, these materials. So for instance, if your director is arranged here uh, along azimuthal lines, and then you keep the material, a disc will turn into a cone. And um, this picture is from the Eindhoven group, uh, Dick Rowers group, Lawrence Dehan was the graduate student at the time. So this started flat here. He sucked the material onto a little glass tube just to hold onto it. And he heats it up and it turns from a disc to a cone. Okay, this is not how you're gonna be opening your umbrella, but you know, it could. So another way, so I mentioned before, we can just do simple rubbing, but we can also pattern. So how do you get that, um, that target shape onto the pneumatic director? So we're gonna pattern two substrates with the topological defect. Here, the top and bottom substrates are identical, and that can be done a lot of different ways. One way is to coat the material with a, uh, a monolayer of a material that uh, orients in response to light and then shine polarized light on it in a pattern to get whatever we want. Uh, but the key issue is if you if you put front and back and then you take that away, you have the material with the pneumatic director here uniform through the thickness because the front and back were the same. But the front and back don't have to be the same. We can have antagonistic anchoring conditions front and back and get a more complicated 3D director from that. Um, another key issue is that there is a pneumatic correlation length. So there's a limit to how far I can put those two pieces of glass apart to really have a pattern that cuts all the way through the material. If we want something thicker than that, another option is 3D printing. And there's a couple different ways to do that. Um, so, so what numbers typically on top of millimeters? Microns. Microns. Only microns. Microns. Because the pneumatic, cor pneumatic correlation length is not that long. But if you 3D print, you can make it as big as you want. Uh, one 3D printing method is basically just to squeeze it out like toothpaste, typical 3D printing, and then the material, the director aligns with the flow direction. It's also possible to deposit it layer at layer by layer, and then um, cross-link selected pixels with a magnetic field to orient just those pixels. So there's all different ways to do 3D printing. Um, the other issue is what I've talked about up till now is freestanding liquid crystal elastomer films where we've removed them from both glass substrates. Another option is to leave the material coating on one substrate. Now we have a material that's not gonna fold or twist or bend as it changes shape, it's just gonna make a changing topography. So then we can have a switchable topography, but the displacements are in the hundreds of nanometers. It's not a huge displacement. Okay, so. I'm not an experimenter, I'm a theorist. And when I first saw these experiments, I was, oh, wow, I have to model this. But the techniques I had been using up till then were things like molecular dynamics and Monte Carlo. And it's like, holy cow, this thing has to be modeled at the laboratory scale. I need finite element. I need to treat this material as a continuum, but I need to have a local variable that describes the pneumatic director and the material has to strain. So the forward problem is if I tell you the shape of the material when it was fabricated, and what the pneumatic director is and something about the material properties, like how much is it gonna shrink? How much is it gonna expand? Um, and it's elastic properties. Can I predict what it's gonna do? So that's the forward problem. Start with an initially simple shape and then evolve towards a more complex shape. More, uh, so the key issue is experimenters would contact me and say, I have this experiment, I have no idea what it means. Can you model it for me and tell me why it's doing what it does? I'll show you an example. Uh, the other issue is there are analytical techniques for making uh, predictions of these shapes, and Mark Warner was the master of, in that field. But it, that work rests on the assumption that you, for instance, can ignore the bending energy, which complicates things a little bit. And we can go beyond the approximation that the bending energy is, uh, is not important and better understand um, experimental results where they don't exactly agree with the analytical predictions. The inverse problem is a richer and more complex problem. We were inspired to think about it because of work by Hillel Aharoni from um, currently at um, the Weizmann Institute. He was at the University of Pennsylvania when he started that work working with Xu Yang. 
So if you have a particular thing you want to do, like I have a disc shaped film and I want it to pop up uh, the shape of a penny. I want to see Abraham Lincoln's face or whoever's on whatever coin, right? I want to get some particular shape. What is the director field that will do that? That's an inverse problem. And that is pushing us towards the direction of engineering design. Like how do you design the director field to get a particular device to work? Okay, so our approach to the forward problem is a nonlinear finite element method that we um, developed at Kent State. It is CUDA friendly, it is super fast. If you've been using a commercial FEM, you are, or you might use a free one like Phoenix, they're all great. I made my own and I like using my own because I can put any, it's a, it's a possibility of doing any kind of multi-physics you want, but it's a, a DIY project. Um, so it's the whole idea here is I'm gonna take my 3D object, whatever it is, or it could be a 2D object and I have to mesh it. So if it's a 2D object, I can mesh it with triangles and they don't have to be equilateral triangles. They can be triangles of whatever shape. High quality mesh shouldn't have really tiny angles though. That can cause instability. So they should be as close to equilibrium or equilateral as you can. Um, it's easy to do by hand to take a, a, a shape and make it into triangles. You can just make it into squares and divide those into triangles. That's an easy thing or use equilateral triangles. Um, what about 3D? You have to use tetrahedra. And I thought, oh, I know, I'll just get some tetrahedral dice. You know, if you play uh, Dungeons and Dragons, people use tetrahedral dice. But, you know, packing with tetrahedra is a complicated subject. You can see a nice paper about it by Sharon Glotzer's group. They don't pack for the same reason you can't tile your form with pentagons. They just don't fit in 3D space. Okay, well, what and what can you do? You can divide your, your system in cubes and then slice each cube into tetrahedra, or you can just get a meshing program. There are a lot of, um, Gmesh is one example of a program that you can find that's free that will take a volume shape of interest and divide it into a tetrahedral mesh for you. Now, how are we going to model it? We want to understand not just the energies, but also the forces that cause objects to move because we want to study the dynamics of an elastic body or elastodynamics. Um, I'm a physicist. I used a Hamiltonian formulation. So let's look at Hamilton. What does Hamiltonian have? Potential energy and kinetic energy. So the potential energy is written like this. So the energy in a Hooke's law spring, one half kx squared. Instead of an x, we have an epsilon, which is the strain. And so the square is epsilon ij epsilon kl. The cij kl is just a, a, a tensor that contains elastic coefficients. Okay, you can put a half in front of it if you want to. This v is just a volume because this is an energy density. So that's the elastic potential energy. Um, I'm going to skip the middle term for a second because that's related to liquid crystal elastomers. We also need a, a kinetic energy, one half mv squared. This mass is distributed in a continuum. It's really hard to do that because I would have to treat each tetrahedron. It would have a moment of inertia. It would be spinning. That's like really complicated. Let's make life simple. We'll take all the mass and put it into the nodes. This is the lumped mass approximation. Okay, so all the mass goes into the nodes. Now, my um, Hamiltonian describes the energy of a system as a function of the positions and velocities of a bunch of point masses. That's what molecular dynamics is. Okay, and the whole idea here is you have a potential energy and a kinetic energy. You can take a derivative of the potential energy with respect to the displacement of one node and get the effective force on that node. The details are a little complicated. I have a set of notes I actually just gave Roscoe yesterday. If anybody wants to do this, I'm perfectly happy to help you build your own code or give you mine. Okay, the term that's in the middle here, uh, wait, I should say one more thing about this. When I first learned about stress and strain, I'm a physics major, they don't teach this to us in mechanics class. I thought, okay, DUI dxj plus uj dxi, it's like the simple strain, right? If you put that energy in here, when you rotate the body, the energy goes up, even though you didn't stretch it. Okay, the linearized strain is not really a good representation because it's not rotation invariant you get fictitious torque because when you rotate, you can just put in the, the um, rotation matrix, generate the displacements, calculate the strain. And if you rotate the body, it makes it look like the energy goes up. So that's, what do the engineers do? They say, well, the strain isn't really a good representation. So we'll use the invariance of the linear strain and build all our potential energies based on that. And I looked at that and said, that is not what a physicist would do. We want something that's actually a good physical quantity. So I went to Landau and Lifshitz and I read about the thing called the Green-Lagrange strain. It's a nonlinear elastic potential energy. It has a quadratic term in it. 
it's invariant under rotation. Any energy that you write that's a function of the green Lagrange strain is going to be invariant under rotation. And we have the master here <laughs> who knows everything about nonlinear elasticity, who can tell you about all the other options. I'm using one particular one. Uh, let's see, what is this one called? Saint Venant. Saint Venant. Yeah. Saint Venant. Okay. Um, so, what is this middle term? Okay, if there's a liquid crystal expert in the room, you will recognize this uh, a scalar order parameter times this thing. That's the QIJ tensor that describes kinematic order. If that's not familiar to you, you cannot worry about it. But the key issue is that couples with the strain. So, QIJ epsilon IJ, this is actually a form I think that was proposed by Dejen. Um, and then the key issue here is that the scalar order parameter is, for instance, dependent, that's how the stimulus happens. So when you when you change the temperature, the scalar order parameter goes down. Here's a typical graph of scalar order parameter versus temperature. In the pneumatic range, the material starts pretty well ordered and it disorders. And then right at the pneumatic isotropic transition, that order goes to zero. But it's not sudden, it goes a little bit. So as you change the temperature, the material is gonna change shape. Um, it's also possible that you can affect the scalar order parameter by shining light, by changing the chemical environment, all those other things. So this is my control parameter. The other issue is there's more than one way that these materials respond. If we're just shining light on it or just changing its temperature, the internal stresses are not that big. So my assumption is that the pneumatic director just rotates with the body and doesn't otherwise change. However, if you start with the material, for instance, pneumatic director north-south in a liquid crystal elastomer thin film, and you stretch it east-west, then you get stripes where individual uh, regions of the material rotate left and right if it's really hard clamped on the sides. And um, I have another model to describe that that I'm not discussing today, but let's just say then the microstru microstructural evolution gets a little more exciting. But here I'm just assuming that the stresses are small enough that that type of soft elasticity is not observed. Okay, the most fun part of any video, of any talk are the videos, right? So this was just us playing with the model. So this thing is just a disc. It's not a liquid crystal elastomer, it's just an elastic disc, and you can see it's flopping. This one, and oh, the video is not coming through very well. Sorry, I'm connected through Zoom, not through a physical connector. So I hope the videos won't be this punchy. But that we call this dancing tofu. Energy here represents um, the sum of kinetic and potential energy. If we don't put any dissipation in the model, just like in molecular dynamics, the sum of kinetic and potential energy will be well conserved if the time step is small enough. If the time step is too big, all hell breaks loose because when uh, tetrahedron, the, 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 the top of the pyramid can go through the floor and underneath like turning a sock inside out. This is called loss of symplectic form. So we have to be careful. We can either just make the time step smaller. It is possible to do an adaptive time step, but I would rather do the, the sort of simple version of the adaptive time step is like, oh, the simulation broke. Let's make the time step smaller and run it again. Okay, so these are just, um, these were tests. I wanted to show you also, I showed this video to Roscoe yesterday. So from the point of view that many people here are modeling um, tissues and cells, the vertex model is one way to describe the behavior of a confluent uh, tissue layer, right? This is some work that was done in collaboration with Craig Maloney, it's not published, but here we just took disks. So this is the 2D version of the model. So they're, they're individually meshed in many small triangles. And here they're just being compressed. What we've added are repulsive interactions between the surface nodes of neighboring disks. So you see this beautiful polygonization as they come to each other and compress. Um, and under this kind of deformation, you see all those types of shape transitions that we would expect, I think, in a confluent tissue. This is very different from the vertex model. All that's in here is elasticity and surface interactions. So if this is the kind of code you would want to build, I can give you the subroutine that calculates the forces and the energies. So, and, and again, this is a DIY, DIY project. You can add any other kind of physics you want to it. We were discussing the possibility. Here, the system has to remember its reference state to calculate the strain. So the energy of the system and the forces depend on the current positions of all the nodes and their positions in the reference state. And we could even put in some viscoelasticity by letting the reference state also evolve, just to think about. So I think of the vertex model as water balloons. These are jello. This is elastic jello. In this case, the reference state is unchanged. They're just really soft, squishy disks. So the inside not a liquid crystal elastic. No, this is not a liquid. This is just jello. This is just elastic, a, a perfectly nonlinear elastic solid. Now, Craig Maloney, for his point, is not really thinking about cells. He's thinking about a beanbag chair 
like soft, squishy objects that that have uh, basically the elasticity of a squishy, glassy mesh. Um, just for this is another toy model of Jello. I was hanging out at the KITP and thinking about how things crawl. So here, what you're seeing, those little blue circles, those are surface nodes. And this little red nose here, what I did is I took my jello sphere, I had it fall down onto a sticky, sticky substrate. So that's why it didn't bounce, it's attracted to the substrate. And then I put a little stress fiber connecting a point in the center to a point on the edge that stretches and shrinks and stretches and shrinks. And then I gave it one way friction on the ground. So it can't slide backwards and it crawls. So from the point of view that you might want to, so here it is falling down, landing, and it's doing its little oscillation here. From the point of view that you might want to do that confluent tissue with three-dimensional balls of jello, it's also theoretically possible. And I have some work planned that will use this for modeling living tissues, but not that's not what I'm talking about today. In terms of simulation speed, this code is it's just like molecular dynamics. Everything can be done in parallel, right? All the force calculations are local. You never have to diagonalize a matrix that's the size of the whole system. It's all completely local. So this was actually, this is a year old, this slide. So maybe it's not even faster. On one single GPU equipped node with 28 cores, we can get a thousand type steps per minute with a mesh that contains a million tetrahedral elements. So this is a fast DIY code. So we can run many of these things. Um, I think they might have use in video gaming, this kind of FEM. I talked to one of the graduates from the Kent State, I forget which department, maybe chemistry, who was working in the video game industry. No, he was physics major. And he said, oh, we never run finite element simulations in real time. They're too CPU bound. So we run all the simulations in advance. We just play the movies as part of the, the video game. It's like, we could make this, this thing runs almost in real time. Okay, now let's talk about liquid crystal elastomer. So I showed you the picture of a disc that turns into a cone. Here's a simulation of a disc turning into a cone. Because it has finite thickness, instead of going straight to a cone, first it becomes a hat with the brim and then the brim pops through. So that's the effect of the non-zero um, thickness of the film. Now, one thing I will say, it is a little bit hard to get to the aspect ratio of the actual experiment because our material has to have enough elements through the thickness to represent the strain gradient from stretched on one side to compressed on the other side when there's a bend. So we need, I don't know, at least eight or 10 elements through the thickness. And then if the aspect ratio is huge, that means a whole lot of elements, but the code is fairly fast. So it's worked out okay. So, so that thing goes to the code. But yes. The mesh seems to be a, a uniform mesh. You have to adapt to the change the mesh size and the key would affect the similarity. No, but, but the curvature right at the top might depend on our mesh size. Oh, the other issue is there's an nematic director, right? And so to the extent that the director is, um, I, it's it, it's associated with each tetrahedral element. That means there's a core size for the defect. Okay, and the core size for the defect, which is related to the mesh spacing. So in principle, we could refine the spacing right at the tip and get it sharper. And we could get it adapted as it goes along. Goes. We could we could adapt. Yes. So when you say that the diet will be associated with each other, is it constant or it rotates with the body. So here, the orientation of the director is a constant, but the scalar order parameter, the scalar order parameters are control parameter here. So when we heat the material, the scalar order parameter drops. Each individual element shrinks along its local pneumatic director, but the pneumatic director is defined in the body frame and rotates with the body. Okay, so um, let's talk about auto origami. Vianney Jimenez Pinto is a faculty member at a small public university in Missouri, Lincoln University. Um, although she's going to be a visiting faculty member at Haverford this year. So she was inspired, um, the group at Eindhoven did an experiment where they made the top surface, this is antagonistic anchoring conditions. So they formed the liquid crystal elastomer between two pieces of glass. The top is radial and the bottom has an azimuthal area and a radial area. Okay, and they put the material in between, has a gentle gradient of the pneumatic director from the bottom to the top. And when they heat it, it did some interesting folds. So she ran the finite element simulation. And what's cool about it is not only does it fold, but they're curved folds. I have tried origami a lot of ways. I've never personally been able to make a curved fold. Do you know how to do it? I've never done it, not for lack of trying. Um, okay, and then one of those times when an experimenter called me and said, I have a really cool experiment and I have no idea what it means. Can you help me understand? 
So this is the group of Dick Brower at Technical University Eindhoven in the Netherlands and, um, and his graduate student, Anne-Helene Gelevar. So here's, this, here's the experiment. I have a thin piece of pneumatic elastomer. It has um, the pneumatic director pointing parallel to the long axis of the film on one side, okay, and then perpendicular on the bottom, what pneumatic, what, what we would call homeotropic anchoring condition. So planar on the top, um, homeotropic on the bottom. And then when they shine UV light from the left side, they saw this continuous oscillation process with waves moving away from the light. But if they mounted the same sample upside down, so the homeotropic one is on top, the waves move toward the light and much more slowly. Okay. And so Dick wanted to know, like, what could possibly be causing this? So this picture at the top shows here you've got planar on the top, homeotropic on the bottom, shine UV light from the left side, and you get this, these dancing waves. Okay, so um, I guess I don't have any other pictures to show you. Just to say when they took this material and instead of attaching it to the bench, they attached it to a very thin elastic frame that it can actually move. So it's not attached to the table. When they shine light, it falls across the table. Okay, so they call this walking on sunshine. Okay, it's UV light, it's not sunshine. But um, we managed to publish this in Nature in 2017. And um, it's, it was a great lesson for me that collaborating with really interesting experimenters was so much fun. Uh, okay, so another collaboration we pursued uh, was with Oleg Lerventovich, right at Kent State University, who was an amazing experimenter. This is his former graduate student, Greta Babahanova, who's presently at NIST. So what they did is they made liquid crystal elastomer coatings with um, disclinations in them. So topological defects, in this case, poking through the thin film. So if you look from above, you would see something like this. Okay, so this material has the same pattern on the top and the bottom. You assemble it, you cross-link it, and then you take one piece of glass off. And so the director is uniform through the thickness. Um, and then she heats it, and when she heats it, every one of these plus one defects turns into a little dimple indentation. Okay, so and there's minus one defects too, right? So we have plus ones and minus ones. Let's see what, Happened. So my student Yusuf Golistani was dying to model the system. So he put that microstructure into our simulation and got exactly the same kind of structure. Everywhere there is a plus one defect, you get an indentation. If you put the temperature back where you started, it disappears again. So this is a reversible um, topographic uh, transition. Um, on the other hand, if you change the orientation of the defect, so they're azimuthal instead of radial, just like making those cones, these things pop up and then you get. Um, uh, little emerging, I don't know, they're not exactly volcanoes, but little pointy things coming up out. And you can see the simulation more or less exactly matches the experiment. Um, and then we tried changing the angle continuously between radial and azimuthal. And you can see that the displacement out of the field just follows a simple cosine two theta function. Um, Jonathan has some theory to explain that, but I don't have that in this talk. So radial dimples to azimuthal stripes, uh, spikes. This doesn't want to go forward. There we go. Um, I'm just gonna skip that part. We can put in higher order defects. Um, so plus minus one, plus two, minus two, plus three, minus three, all of these different type of textures can be formed. I'm not sure what they're useful for, but they could do something. Then we tried, um, Yusuf wanted to see if we could make something more interesting by not just doing pure radial or pure azimuthal, but by making a more complicated defect where it could be, for instance, radial at the core and azimuthal at the outside or vice versa. So just to give it some texture across. Um, and he it's characterized by two variables, one that describes uh, one that describes the um, the distance over which it changed, and the other one describes how rapidly it changes. Okay, and we got something that looked a little bit like octopus sucker. So this material is flat when formed. When you heat it, it pops up these little suction cups. And we said, well, how can we optimize that? I mean, here's what octopus suckers actually look like. And we thought, well, it's kind of similar looking. What else can we do? So here's my close encounter with an actual octopus. If you ever go to Hawaii, I don't recommend going to Maui right now. They're still recovering from a horrible tragedy that just happened there. But on the big island, not far from the airport, it's near Kailua Kona, um, there's an octopus research center where you can just buy a ticket and come in and have a lesson about the 
um, biology and behavior of octopus, and then they let you put your hands in the tank and actually play with them. And I was surprised at how stretchy the suction cups are. And um, what a pity that we evolved without them, because they're a really amazing thing. <laughs> <about them size. laughs> yeah, so if you're, if you're in Hawaii, it's definitely worth a visit, the Kanaloa Octopus Research Center. Okay, so how do we do the inverse problem? In comes Bedell Lombanga. Bedell finished his PhD with me, I think, I don't know, maybe 2010, 2012, it's been a while. Um, and so he agreed, he's now a senior vice president at a major bank in Pittsburgh. Um, where he is uh, uh, director of all data science activities for a major bank, PNC mm -hmm. Bank. So he agreed to co-advise uh, a newer student, Yusuf Golastani, who wanted to do this. So he's the expert on machine learning, not me. But the idea is we have this plus one, minus one defect array, but we want to optimize the shape of the defects to get a particular shape. For instance, octopus suckers, how could we do it? So we decided that... Um, we were just gonna create a giant machine learning set by running our simulation for many different sets of parameters and then use that giant data set to train uh, a machine learning model that could then predict what parameters will give us a particular shape. Okay, so the forward problem, we ran it about 1500 times for different combinations of parameters. And then the inverse problem is gonna be trained on all that forward data. Um, and then we'll give it a shape and say, how do we make this shape of a suction cup or whatever thing? And it will tell us the two parameters that will give us, that define the director field that give us that shape. Um, instead of doing the whole two-dimensional data set, we cut diagonal lines across it and said in the topographic shape transform shape, there's a height as a function of position along that line. We'll use that data as our training data. And so you get different profiles for different values of the two parameters. And, um, and then we had to actually run all of them. So the training set is just like a zillion different uh, versions of those two parameters. Each of them has a shape. From that shape, we take the top topography across the diagonal. And we did 1,509 FEM simulations in one night. And they cost, in terms of uh, fake computer money, uh, five cents each. These are fast. And again, one node at the supercomputer. Okay, so we have this big data set. Um, uh, let's see, what else do I wanna say? So one half of the data, we, we varied one parameter with increments of 1% and held the other one, uh, had the other one varied by increments of 10% and then vice versa. So with those 1,509 simulations, then the question is, um, Angela might ask me, what kind of machine learning did you do? And the answer is, oh, ask Bedell, but it was um, auto gluon from Amazon, uh, so it's a stacked ensemble training package and has all these different models in it. Each model fits the training individually for each target, and then models are ranked and combined separately for each fitted variable. Um, we measured how well it worked and compared what was predicted with what was found. Um, and we tried adding noise and showing that the system could still find the appropriate value. So this is still at the baby stages. Um, Oleg's group actually took our optimized values of the parameters and they've gone and fabricated the um, actual elastomer. You can see here are the suction cups. And this work is being done by a brilliant young experimenter, Nolanthi Patanini at Kent State in Oleg's group. Um, I think I'm going to just mention one work we have done that is published. We considered a case with antagonistic uh, pattern substrate, where one substrate just has uniform planar anchoring. And the other one has the director just rotating along the x-axis. If you put those two things together, put the liquid crystal inside, uh, the material forms an array of parallel line disclinations. And they are identical to each other, and they're evenly spaced. They're not exactly halfway between the two substrates. Their location depends on the, the elastic constants of the material, twist, splay, and bend. So they'll be a little closer to one side or the other. But when you um, cross-link this material, you're cross-linking in those dislocation, disclinations and the pattern. And then we remove one side or the other of the glass and we have a coating. And when you heat it, you get an array of microchannels. Okay, so they just, this is an experimental study again by Greta Babakanova. Here's an experiment, I mean, a, a simulation done by Yusuf Golistani with the finite element simulation that produces those beautiful channels. What we did find is there was a really, bizarre edge effect that you could see that those channels don't cut all the way through to the edge. That's the result of the 3D finite element simulation. If I were an experimenter 
and I made this thing and I saw my channels didn't go through, I would be inclined to just take a knife and cut off the bad part on the edge. But what, what we've shown is that the new edge will look exactly the same. It's just from the free surface elastic relaxation. So even if you cut off this bad part, a new bad part will form. So if you want the material to have channels that cut all the way through, you're gonna to have to clamp it some other way. Um, I should also say Sajida Afka, who now works at Intel, did the modeling of the microstructure so we could figure out where the disclinations were and what the director field should be. Um, and Sajida also did some beautiful simulations just of all different kinds of, of antagonistic boundary conditions. And we can make disclination lines that are like smoke rings that sit in the middle, not touching the top or the bottom, or they can be tethered to the top and the bottom, or you can have little arches along one substrate. So by manipulating the surface anchoring conditions in a liquid crystal cell, we can create all kinds of complicated disclination microstructures. And these can be used as design elements for a liquid crystal elastomer, but they're also just interesting on their own as ways to control structure in soft condensed matter. Okay, I think um, there's just some other examples of some fun different fits. And I mentioned this one because Mark Warner worked on that one. Anyway, so I wanna just ask if anybody has any questions and then I'm gonna tell you a short version of another completely different story. So any questions about liquid crystal elastomers and finite element, DIY finite element nonlinear elastodynamics. Yes. Uh, I did have a question about the parallelizability of your code because I would have imagined that the triangles would talk to each other. But you're, uh, if it's parallelizable, that means that you can solve each uh, each triangle independently of each other and just stitch them together once. You... Here's how it works: when you do molecular dynamics, each molecule gets forces from all the nearby molecules. Okay. Here, the energy and forces are calculated element by element. If they're triangles in two D, then for each element, you get a set. You get an energy. Right, a potential energy for the triangle. And then you get generalized forces on each of the three nodes. Each node is a member of multiple triangle of triangular elements. Okay, so you have to sum vector wise all those forces. So it's, it acts like a many body potential, but you have to calculate it triangle by triangle in 3D tetrahedron by tetrahedron. But the forces can be calculated in parallel on every element and then vector wise summed on each node, just as you do all the forces from all the molecules in an MV code. Does that make more sense? Yes. Okay, so everything's very local and you don't need long distance. Now, what about finding neighbors? In molecular dynamics, everybody has to find their neighbors. In the finite element code, everybody knows who their neighbors are because we have a list of which nodes are in each element. But if you have a long rod and it folds over and touches itself, if you don't do anything about that, it'll ghost right through. Okay, so then you have to add collision detection. So those those squishy jello discs that I showed you, they have collision detection and the surface nodes repel. We just use the Weeks Chandler Anderson potential, which is the Leonard Jones potential cut off at the minimum. I postdoc with Weeks, so I'd like to advertise this work. Anyway, it's a very useful short range repulsive potential. But if you want them to be sticky, you could use, you could put in de um, depletion interaction, you could put in um, any other kind of interaction you think would be important. And that way they won't go through each other. If you have internal voids, if your material is Swiss cheese, if those voids collapse, then again, the surface nodes on, in the interior also need to do collision detection. Okay, was there another question? Yeah. Yeah. It could, we did not take that into account because our mesh is not really at that scale, but it could be important. The other issue is, we didn't include in this simulation anything about the frank free energy because we're just assuming the pneumatic director just rotates. But you know, it's also possible if you are studying soft elasticity, we've done some, like I said, we published one paper, we looked at that stripe instability. Um, we've also done like poly domain to mono domain, and then we really need that energy in there. Yes. So a more kind of general question. So these are amazing materials, but why, what's the problem of making like them commercially available? I mean, why can't work like curtains that are gonna close themselves automatically by any sunny or the UK? But I think Chris Yakaki, who is in um Denver, I think is he University of University of Colorado at Denver. He has been make, working on biomedical implants and Taylor Ware at Texas a has also been working at biomedical implants. I haven't seen anything that was a garment or 
uh, a soft robotic actuator, but I sure hope those things are coming. Like, so all the initial experiments that were in the early era for this kind of system, they were lifting office products. Like we saw a clamp, right, that, that Terentia have used. Sometimes you see paper clips, but now they can lift actual weights. So Tim White is working on, you know, really optimizing the chemistry to get good lift. You know, these things, they, they can do work that is so much bigger than their own mass. They're very effective, but they're kind of slow. Um, one option is to think about, um, and Terentia was working on, um, braille displays. So braille displays, uh, the conventional ones that I've seen actually for sale, they use non-soft materials. They use um, uh, shape memory alloys or some other thing, and they're hugely expensive. So the question is, can we make a cheap display? Are there other ways to make a braille display just for reading? What about a haptic display? Maybe you want a topographic texture that you can touch for gaming or entertainment. Those things are all possible, but the question is how do we make it fast? And it's a lot easier if things respond to electric fields rather like a regular liquid crystal display does rather than temperature because heat transfer is slow. We need something faster. So I have to wait for the chemist to do a better job. Okay, I wanna tell you another story, but I'm gonna to try to make it quick. Frank Reed sources. So a Frank Reed source is something I learned about in material science class. It's something that we know from uh, plasticity of crystal and solids. So I just wanted to ask how many people here have heard the name of the thing called a Frank Reed source? Jose says, no, never saw it. You too know, okay, good. Uh, so um, I will tell you what they are. So this work, I'm gonna highlight Cheng Long. He's a graduate student of Jonathan's. He's just defended his PhD at Penn State. He's gonna be starting as a postdoc with David Nelson in a couple of weeks. Matthew Deutsch is my graduate student, but he is half time at Los Alamos National Lab. So working on this project in his copious free time when he's not working at the lab. Okay, Frank Reed source, and it's the same Frank as the Frank Free Energy, Sir, I think it's Sir Frederick Charles Frank. Um, uh, so when you bend a paper clip, maybe you remember what an FCC crystal looks like. You saw it in chemistry class at some point. If you took that plastic model of, uh, of an FCC lattice and you sheared it, it would fracture. And yet when you bend the paper clip, it bends instead of breaking. How can metals be ductile? Well, um, Charles Frank and uh, another researcher, Thornton Reed, both had the same idea in about 1950, that what happens is a dislocation. So I think you've all probably seen dislocations. Here's an edge dislocation. There's also screw dislocations. A dislocation that is pinned at two spots. When you apply a stress, there's a force called the peach Kaler force that pushes the defect to move. If it were free, it would just stay straight and transit along the direction the stress is pushing it. But if it's pinned in two spots, it bows out. And it bows out in this peculiar way so that the backside comes back and the two sides touch, rewire, reconnect, and then expand. And, um, and so from a Frank Reed source in a crystalline solid, you would expect under shear or whatever deformation, a whole family of concentric dislocation loops expanding and expanding. The materials inside each loop has slipped by one atomic spacing. And at, so you get one more atomic spacing and one more atomic spacing every time a loop comes out. And um, if there is a free surface, those loops will expand and annihilate on the free surface, making permanent plastic deformation. However, if they get stuck, there's a back stress. So they interact with each other, they repel, there's a back stress that shuts down the source. So there's a limit of crystal plasticity when you've exhausted all your sources, then the strain, uh, as you keep pushing, the stress rises and eventually the largest crack becomes unstable and you can get fracture. Okay, but the other thing is while dislocations are moving, they might pin in two spots and make a new source. Um, dislocations can also pin by a variety of mechanisms. They can tang on another, tangle on another dislocation. Um, they can just cross lift funny and stick themselves in the lattice. They can be attracted to um, a vacancy. There's all kinds of ways uh, dislocations can pin. Okay, so how do we come to the idea that such a thing could exist in a liquid crystal? Okay, we have a colleague at Kent State, Hiroshi Yokoyama, who had a brilliant young student, Joe Angelo, and they did an experiment where they um, put an anchoring condition on one substrate in a really funny liquid crystal cell where the top surface could rotate relative to the bottom surface. And so they put a plus one half defect and a minus one half defect and on one surface and planar anchoring on the other side. 
fill that with a pneumatic and it will spontaneous form, spontaneously form a little disclination arch, like half of a loop, okay? And then they rotated the anchoring coxer, actually they rotated the bottom with respect to the top. The key issue is they twisted them. And what they saw was that the dislocation half loop dragged sideways. And they were doing this experiment to try to measure the line tension and other properties of the line defect. But then I saw the results in, um, in Joe's uh, dissertation defense. And I saw these pictures and I said, that looks just like a free green source. And I said, Joe, you did a you did an experiment where you demonstrated that a medic with a crystal can have a frank reed source. And his response was, What is a frank reed source? He'd never heard of it. Okay, so this is a reminder that um, that the scientific community can become a tower of Babel where everybody has their own language and they don't learn each other's discipline. I really think every physics major and every chemistry major should know at least a little material science. Okay, so um, they published this paper without using the word frank reed source. They didn't know what they were seeing. So um, Here's a better picture. They didn't actually do a superposition of a plus one half and a minus one half defect. They did this by rubbing. So they just made three little rubbing directions. So most of the sample has planar anchoring along one axis. Then they have these three little domains, but there's really a plus one half defect and a minus uh, one half. So plus one half, minus, and there's a little arch, and then the top is planar and they rotate it. One with respect to the other. Okay, and again, here, here's these shapes. Um, they only snapped off one loop, but I will tell you, if you twist it another 180 degrees, you get another loop. Twist another 180 degrees, you get another loop. So each of these, again, inside the loop, the material is untwisted by a half twist relative to what's around it. And again, if those defects go out and they annihilate at the free surface, then there's no backstrap. and it'll just keep producing forever. Okay, so... Um... So I mentioned this thing called the peak Taylor force. That's the force on the disclination, sorry, here, dislocation line as a function of the stress tensor and the properties of the defect. Jonathan um, worked out all the details for what that is for disclinations. Um, there is uh, the paper by, or the, I think it's a book by Clayman. Um, and then this is, so um, Cheng Long is the first author of this 2021 paper that explains how the peach Kaler force works for dis disclinations. Um, and then the question is, how do you pin disclinations in a pneumatic liquid crystal? We've seen from all the active matter simulations, when two disclinations come together, they just reconnect and they don't tangle so easily. They don't always tangle anyway. So here we've attached them to the substrate, but it might also be possible to put colloid particles. You know, if you put planar anchoring on a colloid because of the Gauss-Bonnet theorem, there have to be some defects, right? And so typically you would get over plus one half defects on the surface of a spherical colloid, and they could make two half loops, which then could be Frank Reed sources, or you can just write them on the walls. Um, I don't have much time, so let me just say, okay, so how, how do we model the system? We start with a lando Gen represent, so we represent the QIJ tensor at each point in space. So this is a continuum model, not a molecular one. And then we have an overdamped equation of motion. Um, this is Cheng's simulation where you see the arch we're viewing from above. So it looks like a little straight line. And then when you twist, it starts bowing out, bowing out. Then we zoom out a little bit. So we're looking at that from a distance and then it bows out further, 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 further and snaps off. Okay, so Cheng uh, and Jonathan also developed an analytical calculation just like you can do for a regular Frank Reed source in a crystal and solid. There's a higher energy density outside the loop. There's a lower energy density inside the loop because it's untwisted a little bit. Plus there's an energy cost associated with the line tension. And they demonstrated that the analytical model really, really matches the quasi-static simulations. So the key issue is uh, for both the Frank Reed source in crystal and solids and in the matic liquid crystal, the critical stress and emission drops roughly with one over the, the segment length. So the bigger they are, the easier they fall, right? The farther apart they are, the less stress it takes to cause them to pop. As a child, you probably blew, blew bubbles um, you know, with a little hoop. And maybe you had a little hoop and you had a bigger hoop. Which one was easier to, to make the bubble go out? It's sometimes the, the little ones, are you have to push hard to get them to go through, right? So it makes it easy. You need less uh, force per unit area for a bigger one. 
So here is um, Cheng's simulation. This is a quasi-static loading, meaning he applies the twist and just waits. Um, so it's not a continuous strain, but you can see the defect coming out and snapping off. And if you keep going every 180 degrees, you get another one. Okay, uh, my student, Matthew Deutsch, wanted to do the finite temperature, finite strain rate version. I'll just show you a quick video so you can see um, same story. Here at the top and bottom, this is hugely stretched, but there's an arch and then defects pop off. So what does this have to do with this program? Active matter, the 3D active matter system, use, the 3D system is visualized always in the bulk. They never show you the surface, okay? And they, um, so in, in the 2D active matter system, for instance, the dojic microtubule system driven with kinesin motors, the stress goes to a really high value and then homogeneous defect pair nucleation arises over and over in random places. However, if you put Frank Reed sources in a 3D system, the stress can never get that high. Heterogeneous nucleation, which is what the Frank Reed source is, always occurs at a stress lower than that necessary for homogeneous nucleation. And it always happens in the same place where the source is. So we could use engineered Frank Reed sources in an active pneumatic to suppress chaos and create order in the microstructural evolution, which I think is a, a fun opportunity to consider. And again, instead of just putting pinning points on the walls, which would not be enough to reduce stress in the bulk, we might also use colloids or pillars or some other kind of way to put Frank Reed sources in the interior of the sample. So it's it's just another mechanism of microstructural evolution, but one we can control. And just to contrast it, in crystals, when we deform a crystal, Frank Reed sources form at random through a stochastic process where defects intersect or run into other obstacles. Whereas in the pneumatic liquid crystal, we can engineer them, we can put them where we want them and really have control of microstructural evolution. Okay, I think I'm just gonna cut to the chase because we're out of time, just to say there are strain rate effects and temperature effects. Um, just as far as, again, this is a GPU based code, the, the finite, uh, sorry, what is this one? This is a label Lasher model that we're using for finite strain rate. We can, again, everything is parallel and we can do it in CUDA. Um, I'm gonna skip that too, although it's interesting. We have also the idea that so far we've just activated the Frank Reed source just by applying a mechanical twist. Right? But maybe there's other ways. Maybe we can do it with an electric field. Maybe we can do it with fluid flow. So Marco Matza, who was here last week, showed me a simulation that his group member did where they had um, a cylinder in a microfluidic channel filled with pneumatic. And there was a so-called Saturn ring defect around the cylinder. And then they run fluid, pneumatic fluid through the cylinder. And that Saturn ring stretches out, stretches out, stretches out and snaps off a point or snaps off a loop. As the loop transit down, transits down the channel, it shrinks away to nothing. So it's not really a source in that sense, but it's a similar kind of problem, right? Of controlling microstructure. Um, uh, let's see, I'm just gonna put up, here's a list of collaborators. Is there anybody I didn't mention? Chi Ho Wei is an experimenter who used to be at Kent State. He's now at a university in China in Shenzhen called SUSTEC. We're visiting him later this fall. Uh, Dick Brower and Eindhoven, and actually I'm collaborating with another faculty member at Eindhoven, Don Ching Liu, who's doing amazing stuff. And she's actually hired Yusuf as her next postdoc. He's already been modeling her latest experiment. Uh, I guess that's everybody. All right, I'll just put up some conclusion slides for part two, and I'd be happy to answer your questions. Questions for Robin. Um, so you're uh, making a nice connection between um, uh, the line defects and active matter, uh, but what about using that control over the line defects uh, in uh, crystal elastomers? That, give, that gives you, I'm sure, yet another whole space of control. Okay, so this could be done with the material before it's cross-linked. Once it's cross-linked, the defects are, are um, localized in the microstructure. Um, you could, in particular, uh, put a, a source in the middle of a sample, spin this thing around a few times, and just get some concentric rings. 
and then cross-link that. However, we have other ways to control the microstructure just by putting a static anchoring pattern on the top and bottom. Oh, okay. Right. So we have That's other easy. ways to do it that are maybe a little bit more. On the other hand, you never know. We might be able to make something um, dynamically that we can't make statically. Uh, I don't know. I have to think about it, though. It's an interesting idea. Yes? So you mentioned having had a couple of these uh, Frank Green sources. How would the loops interact with each other? They yes. Okay. So the, the, some of the slides I skipped were from some experiments by Chen Hu Peng. So he just had a square lattice of plus and minus. And what happened is each little um, half loop, they went together and annihilated. But that created two loops like this. And then they went together and annihilated. So they were not far enough apart to actually emit loops. They just touched. But if we put those sources far apart, um, the Burgers vector equivalent for the pneumatic, like the, the it, you can't really define topological charge for topological defects in QTE. It's, you can't just give them a Burgers vector. It's more complicated than that. But I think what would happen is that the loops, when they touch, they would annihilate and turn into a bigger loop. So um, essentially, you've slipped the region in this loop, you've slipped the region in this loop, so the two slipped regions can merge. Um, another thing that I think is really interesting is an analogy between soft condensed matter and crystalline solids is the idea of uh, essentially a shear band. Like if you're twisting, let's imagine an experiment. We had two surfaces with planar anchoring this way and planar anchoring this way, and then we twist, twist them with respect to each other. So the stress would build up to a really high level and then a whole bunch of defects would form and fly everywhere. But if we put a Frank Reed source in the system, as we twist, the defects would always come out in the same place. If we had, again, a whole array of them, and then all the disclination motion would be in a single plane. So we would essentially be making a, making a slip band. Um, and that might really change the rheology. The challenge for us is none of our models has fluid dynamics in it. So Marco Mata is, is promising to help us get some, uh, some fluid dynamics. In, so we'll have a real model that can predict the rheology and not just the microstructure. But who knows, maybe it'll be a new kind of loop thing. What I don't know is whether the material will be more or less viscous with or without line defects. You would think it would be less viscous and it would be really predictable how it would behave. Any other questions? Okay, so let's start